to, where are you? Well, not where are you, you're here. Where are your fellow Subunji University first years? They failed. Anyway, nice to see you guys. Um, just to remind you, we are in the middle of the eight lectures I'm giving, two coming up now. Uh, so the first six are about evolution. Today, I'm going to talk about two things. One I've called evolution's tempo, mega events and innovation in the history of life. So this is the big picture of evolution. Remember, we've talked about how allele frequencies change in populations, Hardy Weinberg. Remember, we've talked about how populations inevitably diverge genetically if they're not communicating. That ultimately results in speciation. Remember, we talked about how we can reconstruct the history of life. Multiple speciation events. Many, many speciation events. We do that using the fossil record and phylogenetic reconstruction. Now, if you like, we've got the tools. I want to look at the big picture of evolution. That's first. And then second, the most interesting question in evolution. The most interesting question in biology. The most interesting question there is. Where did we, humans, us, you, come from? So I'm going to talk after the break about human evolution. A um, couple of things up front. One, you should recognize this. This is Geli Bolu. Uh, welcome back. Uh, I enjoyed myself. I hope you had a good time. Uh, second thing. Uh, tomorrow, this is me. Uh, this is Alfred Russell Wallace. Alfred Russell Wallace is... Um, a very important and very interesting figure in the history of science. He co-discovered with Charles Darwin uh, the theory of evolution by natural selection. He's a big guy, but everyone's forgotten him, except me. Okay, And he died 100 years ago, so I'm going to give a talk uh, tomorrow at 4 p.m. Uh, about Alfred Russell Wallace. It'll be fascinating. Don't miss it. Okay? Uh, so that's the advertising done. So that is tomorrow. Okay? 4 p.m. tomorrow. Don't miss it. Okay. Let's talk about mega events and the history of life. And I'm going to... So there are two kinds of mega events. One which increases diversity. Yeehaw! Okay? And the other of which removes diversity, which smashes things decimates biological diversity. So I'm going to start with, the th with innovation, with creating novelty to start with, and then I'm going to uh, finish uh, this class where we're talking about decimating diversity, and specifically I'm going to be talking about mass extinction. The notion that the animals and plants we see on planet today are a product of events completely beyond our controls. Huge rocks! The size of Manhattan falling out of the sky and hitting the planet. Mass extinction events. You're going there, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so let's start with its Cambrian explosion, uh, which is a huge deal. Why? As I've told you, life originated 3.5 billion years ago. For the next 3 billion years, more or less, life was a story of microbes. Very simple, single-celled organisms. Yes, you have the evolution of eukaryotes, so those are more complex cells. And you do get some simple multicellular forms of life. In fact, about 600 million years ago, uh, you got some rather simple forms. It was 540 million years ago when you have the so-called Cambrian explosion. When suddenly... Life is three billion years old, and then suddenly you get a huge diversification, this explosion, and it's called the Cambrian explosion, this explosion of biological diversity. So that's what I want to talk about. But before that, these were the most complicated organisms. They're called the Ediacarian fauna, Ediacarian, and they're very, they're multicellular, of course. But they're very simple. They're two-dimensional. They don't... So they're just sheets. 
they don't have circulatory systems. Okay? So you have a circulatory system, which means you can take in oxygen across your lungs into your bloodstream and then distribute that oxygen to your foot by your circulatory system. These animals had no circulatory system, so everything had to diffuse directly to the tissues that they needed it. And they're boring. They're stationary. They, they look like this. Okay? They're underwater and they're doing this. Ah. Uh, uh, it's not exciting, okay? Um, so that was about 600 million years ago. Then suddenly, and it really was suddenly, um, we have this so-called uh, uh, Cambrian explosion. And there's a set of fossils from Canada called the Burgess Shale that is very informative, very rich uh, from this period. And what you see is boring... No fossils, boring fossils, simple fossils, and suddenly lots and lots of really exciting, interesting fossils. Um, now, this didn't happen overnight, probably. It still took many millions of years. But the key thing here is that, as I've written here, the planet had gone from biologically primitive, simple, to biologically modern, complex, in one enormous stride. So something happened, some explosion happened, and we don't really know the causes. We can make intelligent guesses about the causes, but we don't really understand what happened. It happened such a long time ago, and we only have limited fossils. Um, the reason this guy's here, he's the guy who discovered the, he's called Walcott, he discovered the British Shale fossils. Let's look at some of these animals. They're pretty wacky, okay? Um, they don't look very much like things we're familiar with today, but they're doing many of the familiar things that we see today. We've got animals which are being predators, animals which are um, foraging on the uh, sea bed. We've got animals which are eating plants. Um, and some of them are really whacked out. See the name of this thing? Hallucinogenia. <laughs> I'm bad. I'm hallucinating. When, you, when the person who described that saw that. In fact, he was so hallucinating that he reconstructed it upside down. We've now decided these aren't legs. They're spikes on the back of the organism. Um, critical to this development was the invention of what you might call modern ecology, i.e. the rich and complex set of interactions you see in nature today, including... Uh, the first predator, the first big nasty predator. It's called Anomalocaris. Scientists have discovered the cause has called them Anomalocaris, meaning a strange shrimp. That name is now used for the whole planet. With its large tail and flexible plates along its flanks, Anomalocaris could propel itself through the water at speed. Other specimens show that it could grow to a length of nearly a meter, two feet or so. It was, as far as we know, the first big predator. This, as I say, was Earth's first killer. Let's watch it kill. Here's an innocent little bystander animal. It has, this is an unhappy story, folks. Brace yourselves. Not a good way to go. Let's do it again. There it is. Sweet little thing. Oof. Oh. Now, the critical thing is not only here do we have the invention or the first appearance of critical forms of life, i.e. predators, i.e. herbivores, and so on, we also are getting the basic types of life. This is something called Pikea from the Burgess Shale, and it looks like a swimming worm. In fact, we have good reason to believe this is the first known chordate. We are chordates. Fish are chordates. Okay? That is the phylum, the group that we all belong to. So that phylum originated way back when in the Burgess Shale era, 540 million years ago, the, the uh, Cambrian explosion. So, what caused it? Why then? Well, as I say, there are many interesting theories. Uh, 
Two of which I'll mention before focusing on the third. One is that maybe through a series of geochemical events, this was the first time on the planet there was enough oxygen to support complex life. So you need to have reasonably high levels of oxygen in order to have a complex metabolism and to become large, right? So one is an extrinsic factor like that. The second is an intrinsic factor, which is maybe at this stage, at about 540 million years ago, ge the genetics of development of producing different body plans had reached a necessary stage of sophistication to allow the diversification of many different body plans. In other words, you've got very simple genetics, very simple genetics, you reach a threshold where you have a system that can be built on and varied in complex ways. So I'm calling that an intrinsic cause. So we have the oxygen level, we have the evolution of uh, complex developmental genetics. Two, third thing which I want to focus on is an ecological thing. And I want to introduce you to an idea called an adaptive radiation. The most famous adaptive radiation is in the Galapagos Islands, where, as you know, Charles Darwin went and saw the finches. Now, you probably know this from high school, but there's no harm in repeating it. Finches, the finches, there are 13 different species on the Galapagos, and they have different sized bills. They can have big nutcracker bills or little insect-eating bills, okay? Many different bills, each of which is specialized for a different food, a different seed size, a different type of food, okay? Now, why do you have so many of those in the Galapagos, okay? Well, the f it's this scenario that, a, say, a medium-billed finch arrived in the Galapagos and it was empty. No other birds, but there's still plenty of insects, still plenty of plants, so plenty of seeds to eat, but no other birds, okay? So, sud remember what natural selection does. Natural selection is all about competition. But this species has arrived, there's no competition. There's lots of food, but no competition. So what happens is you get the so-called adaptive radiation, you get a lot of new species being produced, each specializing, some on the big seeds with the big nutcracker bills, some on smaller seeds, and some on insects, and so on. But that can only happen because there are no other species there. Okay? There's lots of ecological opportunity and no competition. Now you compare that to the situation. Imagine that same finch, the finch that first went to the Galapagos Islands. Now think of it in, Equ in Ecuador, in mainland South America, okay? It's medium-sized bill. It's eating medium-sized seeds. Now, there's some small seeds there and some big seeds there. And there's a bell curve in terms of bill size for this species. So, it's medium. The mean is the medium-sized bill, but then you've got the small bills and the bigger bills. Why don't the small bill ones eat the small seeds? Well, they can try but in the same place, there's another species already present with a small bill that specializes on the small seeds. So those are superior at eating the small seeds than the small build, medium build finches. And the same is true with the end of the distribution of the medium build finches where they have larger bills, the larger seeds, they can eat those. No, they can't because they're being outcompeted by another species which specializes on the large seeds. Big difference when you go then to the Galapagos where there are no other species. Bang! Lots of opportunity. That's what happened in the Cambrian explosion. Now the Galapagos is just one single local instance of adaptive radiation. The uh, Cambrian explosion was an adaptive radiation across the whole planet. The planet was empty, okay? And suddenly, that's why you can have this explosive evolution. So you have, in microcosm, you have explosive evolution and the adaptive radiation on the Galapagos, but in the big picture, across the whole planet, that's what happened 540 million years ago. So let's just actually talk a little bit 
about islands. Because in a sense, the Cambrian explosion is treating the planet as a single island. What about islands that we, real islands that we see? As I say, each one is an evolutionary experiment. Uh, Darwin called them natural laboratories. Now, think about this. This is a photograph of the big island of Hawaii. Active volcano. It's come out of the ocean and it's just creating new land. Okay? The same is true of the Galapagos. Okay? The Galapagos were uh, not existing five million years ago. Volcanic eruption under the sea creates multiple islands. Okay? So, here's a famous example of exactly that process. This happened in 1963. This is Iceland. This is Surtsey down here. And to start with, it was an underwater eruption. Uh, and gradually, it emerged out of the water uh, and cooled down. And today, you have an island. Now, who or what lives on that island? What species live on that island? Well, to start with, nothing, right? Okay. It's empty. But it's completely inhospitable. It's just uh, lava. So let's now think about an island like the Galapagos. Who gets there? So it's going to be a, que a question of colonization. Who can actually get to the Galapagos? Well, you've got seeds and stuff being blown out there. So you're going to get plants blown out there. Uh, who else gets there? Well, birds can get to islands pretty easily, right? Because this is flying. Okay. Um, what about other species? Well, some things can do it, as I say, quite easily. Some things have real difficulty. Imagine being a frog in Ecuador. And it's, whatever, a thousand kilometers across the Pacific to the Galapagos. You can't get there. You start swimming. You have an osmotic crisis and die. Okay? Um, some pat I love this picture. This is sometimes maybe this sort of thing's happen. Here's a lizard. This is a very improbable event, but maybe it sometimes occurs. Who was, um, he was hanging out on a tree in Ecuador. And there was a storm. And the tree fell into the river. Damn, drifts down the river, getting worse, into the ocean. It's really bad, okay? But happily, he's lucky, okay? Because it's going to drift into the Galapagos. Woohoo! All right? Happy lizard, actually not so happy because he didn't bring his girlfriend with him, right? So he's lonely. He's going to go there and promptly that population will go extinct. End of story. But anyway, moral, always travel with your partner, okay? If you're climbing a tree in Ecuador, take your partner with you. Um, the point is that islands are going to have weird, unbalanced ecosystems. They're going to be missing things. They're going to have plenty of birds, but they're not going to have very many fish, freshwater fish or amphibians. Okay? It's going to be weird. Um, and let's just think about what happens. Have you, anyone familiar with this? This is a kangaroo. Um, and you know what they do. Oh my, I mean, this is ridiculous. Has anyone been to Australia and seen kangaroos? Um, now look, it's actually an amazing form of locomotion and it's brilliantly adapted to the plains of Australia. Okay? But kangaroos are also in New Guinea. Okay? Now, New Guinea doesn't have great plains. New Guinea's an island, so the kangaroos made it there. Because it's an island, certain things aren't there. So what would normally live in a tree, taking advantage of all the food up in a tree, if you're a mammal? It's probably going to be a monkey, right? Or some kind of primate. There are no monkeys in New Guinea. They never got to New Guinea. So this is an adaptive radiation. It's an opportunity... It's like arriving in the Galapagos and there's all those seeds and those insects and nothing eating them. The kangaroos got a New Guinea, saw all this stuff up in the forest canopy, nothing eating it. So they evolved to live in the trees. But this is the great thing about this. They didn't evolve very well. 
they're still kangaroos. Kangaroos are adapted for moving across the plains. Okay? Now they're climbing up trees. And I just want to make the point, they're kind of cute, um, but I want to make the point with this, this guy here um, that they're not exactly agile and athletic in the trees. So he's going for a walk. <laughs> now that is the most inelegant thing you've ever seen. These things, yes, because they're no monkeys, they do okay in the trees, but they're just modified from ground living. And now he's pretending he meant to do that all along. <laughs> yeah, I'm just hanging out here. I'm happy. Um, so that is what is happening. Evolution is always taking advantage of the ecological opportunities there. Uh, so that's one example, just, just a group of species in New Guinea. The famous example, as I've already told you, is the adaptive radiation of the finches in the Galapagos. That's the finches in the Galapagos. A more spectacular example is actually in Hawaii, where you've got about 50 species evolved. Very same story, different bills, different food. Um, but islands give species that get there early this opportunity to take advantage of all the unused resources, all the ecological opportunities, um, and to undergo this kind of explosive evolution. So what happened in Hawaii, what happened in the Galapagos to birds, is what happened across the planet in the Cambrian explosion. And by the way, some of these Hawaiian birds, they've gone extinct time, of, sorry to say, are just spectacular, remarkable looking things. Um, okay, so that is explosive diversification. But how can we actually generate new genetic material in evolution? So what I've talked about really so far is let's take a gene, which is a string of A, G, G, C, 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 G, G, C, 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 T, 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 G, 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 C, 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 D, right? And I'm going to change some base pairs, a few mutations. So I change an A to a T at position 92, and I change a C to a T at position 173. Okay? That's not new genetic, it's a change, yes, and that the protein produced by that gene might have very different properties, but it's not new genetic material. And yet, obviously, in evolution, there must be lots of new genetic material. Our genome is a lot bigger and more complex than that of a microbe. Okay? So where does new genetic material come from? Well, one is actually really interesting. It's mainly true in plants. Is, and you've probably learned this in genetics. Um, you get freak events in meiosis that cause polyploidization, does that, polyploidy, does that term mean anything to you? If I, let's ask a question. Who knows what polyploidy means? Hands up. I guess, yes, woo! We got one. Now, I'm not gonna ask you, because you've done the brave thing. Polyploidization is when you get extra full genomes, full sets of chromosomes, okay? You are diploid, right? You have two sets of chromosomes. Very occasionally, you will have, an uh, not a human individual, but you will get in plants a, a tetraploid individual, which has four genomes. Okay? So something has happened. I mean, you can take the simple case. When you generate a gamete in meiosis, you produce a haploid gamete, right? Sperm and eggs are haploid. They're single genomes, right? Uh, if you have a mistake in meiosis, instead of making a haploid gamete, you make a diploid gamete. In other words, one with two genomes. And if that meets another diploid gamete, what do you make? You make a zygote, which is tetraploid, has two plus two equals four genomes tetraploid. Okay? Now, turns out we see this doubling of genomes, polyploidy. Uh, ploidy is the number of chromosomes. Poly just means many. Uh, we see this quite frequently in plants. 
So this is a huge amount of data. This is the number of, uh, number of species. And this is just the count of the haploid number of chromosomes. Okay? Uh, so our haploid number is 23, for example, in humans. Okay? What you, I want you to see here is, look, once you get higher numbers, you've got 14 here, 16 here, 18 here, 20 here. Now, you've got 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. There are peaks consistently on the even numbers. Why is that? Almost certainly because they're the, how do you get an even number? You double something, right? So what it seems to be that there's been repeated doubling events in the history of plants. And that means now we've got tons of DNA, right? Tons of DNA, because you've doubled everything. That was doubling an entire genome. What about doubling a segment of a genome? This is a process called uh, gene duplication. And probably it typically occurs, uh, again, via errors in meiosis. <clears throat> But these are more subtle, more local errors. Let's say you have uh, two gene copies which sit side by side. So these are chromosomes, okay? This is meiosis, okay? So you've got a red copy and a pink, well, it's not really pink. What color is that? Tux! What color is it? Are you all blind? Orange. Orange. So who said that? Top of the class. Uh, good. Orange. It's not really orange, but never mind. <laughs> Red and orange. Um, so obviously in uh, meiosis, you uh, have to line them up, and then you get a uh, crossing over event and so on. Sometimes, because the red and orange genes are very similar, you get mispairing where on this chromosome, the orange pairs with the red on that chromosome. And you get crossing over, but we call that unequal crossing over, okay? Because they're mispaired, misaligned. And what is the product of unequal crossing over? Well, you get, of the four gametes that result, uh, two are normal. One is a deletion product, it's lost one copy. And the other is a uh, addition copy, which has three copies. So this is a simple way to ex expand, this is increasing, and contract the number of copies of a gene. Okay? So now the question is, I, let's say I've just done this. I've got an extra copy of a gene. What happens to that extra copy of a gene? Well, there are three things. Um, one is it can just keep doing the same thing. Fine. It's unnecessary, right? Because if I, if I had one copy before and I now have two, obviously having one is enough, so two is surplus, right? This is the interesting situation. This is the interesting situation. Sometimes you get mutations in one of the two copies that change its function. Now, because a mutation is only changing a little bit, it's only going to change the function a little bit. Because you still have the other copy that is providing the original function, you now have, you now have two genes, one providing the original function, the other providing a new, slightly different function. That can be really important in evolution, and I'll show you why in a minute. Um, that's, if you like, this is the interesting outcome of the fate of duplicate genes. Um, the most common function, okay, I've got one copy, I'm doing fine, I only need one copy, now I have two copies. It was a mistake, but I got two copies. I don't need two copies. Most muta and then a mutation occurs, bang, it, knocked, it screws up the second copy. Maybe it's a stop mutation in the middle of the protein, so it doesn't produce the protein. Maybe it's a frame shift mutation. Some kind of mutation that screws the thing up. Does it matter? No, right? Because I've still got the good copy, right? So if you screw up one of these extra copies, it doesn't matter. So often you then get 
uh, it will evolve, it will become dead, if you like. It's inactive. It's clearly ancestrally related to the original gene, but it's no longer a functional gene. And we call these a pseudogene. Okay? And that's the most common fate of these uh, duplicate copies. Now, let's talk about a really cool example of this, which comes from a gene which is very important to all of us, uh, the globin genes. So hemoglobin, as you probably know, this is the oxygen transport molecule in your bloodstream, is comprised actually of four uh, protein subunits. Okay? So it's a, it's a glued together group of four proteins, each of which is a globin. And when we look, this is, our, this is in humans, um, and you look along the actually two different parts of chromosomes, you find what we call a gene family. Gene family are multiple copies of similar or related genes arrayed along a chromosome. Okay? Um, and they've given them silly names, and it doesn't really matter. I just wanted to make a point that they're out there. The ones here which have this psi symbol are pseudogenes. So they're recognizably related to these other globin genes, but they're dead, they're useless. Okay? So why does this matter? It matters hugely. Um, <clears throat> we can trace the duplications through evolution, Okay, so this is what we have now. I only mentioned a couple of them, but also myoglobin is a co constructed of globin genes. Okay, and you can trace back this duplication process through evolution. The critical thing is that it matters functionally. So, this is what of those different genes you're using through your development, okay? Now, and let's just look around here, okay? So, currently, you're, most of you are older than 48 weeks. Yeah, most of you, good, okay. So, most of you are out here, so which means that you're currently producing beta and alpha globins, okay? That's what your hemoglobin is composed of, right? Now, look back here. This was when you were born. Very different situation. So what you've had is at birth, before you were born, yes, you had alpha, but you also had these two other gamma globins. Very similar, but slightly different. Different members of this gene family. And what has happened is this has declined and this has increased. Okay, they've replaced each other. Why is that? Well, think about it. When you, before you were born, where were you getting your oxygen from? You were getting your oxygen from your mother across the placenta. Okay? That's a very different process, a very different uh, exchange environment than the way you get oxygen now. How, where do you get your oxygen from? Oh, from my mother's placenta. I'm sucking it. No, put it away! It's disgusting. Uh, no, you, I assume, like me, breathe oxygen through, do you? Yeah, okay. You never know with Turks. Could be doing something really weird. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll use injections to get my oxygen. Um, anyway, this is the product of multiple, of these multiple gene duplication events has allowed the evolutionary modification of different copies of that globin gene uh, to produce uh, globin genes which are ex exquisitely adapted for the particular environment in which they're being used. So, finally, before we get on to humans, we're going to do, have a break before humans because you need to caffeinate before the excitement starts. Oop, I'm being videoed. <laughs> um, I want to talk about, again about innovation. One of the startling things about the genome projects has been a really sobering realization. If we take your genome and we compare it to a chimpanzee's genome, it's pretty much the same. Okay? It really is stunningly similar. Now that's not surprising, actually. 
We're all pretty similar to chimpanzees, actually. I mean, if you compare us across all animals, we're incredibly similar to chimpanzees. What's sobering about the genome projects is we're very similar genetically to fish. We're very similar genetically even to fruit flies. With fish, we basically have the same genes as fish. Okay? So, how can that be? I mean, look, we're a lot smarter than, I don't know, do you know any smart fish? No, right? Um, do you know any smart fruit flies? No. Okay? So how can we have basically the same genes and yet be so fantastically different from fish and fruit flies? That's a really important and interesting question. It's an evolutionary question. It's also a, a developmental question. And I'm using this as my, if you like, cipher for this. Here we have two dogs, incredibly different. I mean, this thing could, you know, swallow this thing. <laughs> right? Um, but not just in size, they're different in personality, right? This dog is depressed. <laughs> this is hyperactive. <laughs> right? Okay? Um, so, and, and, and what's more, and you know that, because certain breeds are affectionate and loyal, certain breeds are aggressive, you know, these are genetically encoded differences between the different dog breeds, okay? Now, does anyone have an idea where dogs came from? Yes, sir. Good, good answer. That back corner, normally the back corner is a place where people smoke marijuana and, and I don't know, and, and watch movies, and I actually once sat in a class in America, I was, a friend of my colleague was teaching, I was sitting at the back watching a student buying shoes online. <laughs> anyway, we all need shoes. Um, what was I saying? I got distracted. Wolves, Wolves thank you. Um, about 12,000 years ago, probably, give or take, wolves were domesticated. Okay? 12,000 years ago really is yesterday. I mean, it's very, very recent. And since that domestication, many people in many different places have taken dogs and very carefully bred them to become small and yappy or big and lugubrious or fast like greyhounds or good at hunting or whatever. Okay? There's been tons and tons of human selection for different dog breeds. Okay? But the fact of the matter is you've got very few new mutations in 12,000 years. Mutation is a slow process, right? So even though these guys are stunningly different, they're genetically almost identical. Or obviously they're not absolutely identical, but they are almost identical. Okay? So, so in a sense, dogs are a parallel for life. How can we have so much difference, so much biological diversity at the phenotypic level coupled with relatively little difference at the genetic level? And the answer is through the developmental program. Have you talked about developmental genetics at all in NS102? Okay, so the genetics of development is stunning. Okay, let's, we start don't think about this. This is dangerous to think about. But you started when your parents... No, don't go there, okay? But there was a sperm, and there was an egg. They came together. This is you, okay? This was all you were. Wiggle, 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 blob. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Oh, hello! Okay? That's you. And to start with, all you are is that egg with a huge quantity of DNA, some from mom and some from dad, okay? Um, what then happened? It's amazing, actually. You have this carefully choreographed process, carefully orchestrated process, where you go from, you start producing some proteins, you produce protein A, which switches on genes B, C, and D, and then the protein from B T switches on genes E, F, and G, and so you have this hierarchical cascade of developmental processes. Wow! 
And it's that which eventually puts you together. This is a beautiful illustration of that process. Okay? This is a famous mutation in fruit flies. It's called Antenopedia. Now, I study fruit flies, so to me, this is a beautiful thing. That is the face of a fruit fly. That is its little beautiful lips. And these are its rather big eyes. Okay? It's beautiful. And here are its antennae. Okay? This is a mutant. One base pair different. One base pair different. And look, instead of antennae, this thing has legs sticking out of its head. It's amazing. Fully formed legs are sticking out the head of the fruit fly. What's happened? What has happened is one of those genes that act very high up in that hierarchy of development has been messed with. And it's a gene that specifies the geography of the embryo. And normally that gene should be expressed here, saying put a leg here. Okay? Instead, it's being expressed here, so you're getting a leg here. But it's recruited all the other genes, all the other proteins that are required to make a perfectly formed legs. These are called homeotic mutations, where you get the wrong thing in the wrong place. Here's another uh, example from fruit flies. They should have one pair of wings and these funny little... This thing has two sets of wings. It's extraordinary. These are just single genetic changes. Obviously at very specified genes. Um, and this is the set of genes. They're called the homeobox genes. Uh, don't worry with the details. But the important thing is these genes, these are just stretches of DNA. They specify the identity, the geography of different segments in the embryo. So this is the head, thoracic one, thoracic two, thoracic three, abdomen one, abdomen two, and so on and so forth. And it's not just in fruit flies, it's also true in you. You have these genes, they specify, but you're saying, I don't have segments. Yes, you do. You're a segmental organism. Your spinal cord, for example, is each one a segment. Each vertebra, vertebra is ultimately a segment. And it turns out that these genes are very fundamental to all of life. And again, this is unimportant. This is a family tree of basically all of life. You've got incredibly simple animals here. Even jellyfish have them. They only have two. Mammals, mouse and humans, we have lots. Okay? But it's the same story. It's the same basic genes which are, if you like, uh, creating the architecture of the animal. Which means that you can tweak those genes with major effect. So what this means is, is in some ways, some sense, evolution is a simpler process than we first thought. You think about all of the diversity of forms out there. We first believe that this would involve all sorts of novel creations, starting from scratch, again and again and again. We now understand that now that that evolution works with. Uh, So these are the fly segments. is the building up of diversity. What are the sources of innovation? How do you innovate? How do you generate novelty in evolution? Cambrian explosion, great example. Adaptive radiation on islands, that's a local phenomenon. Uh, but then we've got genetic mechanisms such as ex increasing genomes, increasing genome uh, duplications, 
that create genetic novelty. And then finally, we have development, which actually turns that into uh, new forms. What about decimating diversity? Mass extinction. So you all know about the big one, the one that killed the dinosaurs, a huge great big rock fell out of space and hit the dinosaurs on the head. Now, this is a lot of data, I appreciate, but and just really look at this table, uh, this graph. This is a plot, this is an enormous amount of data from 500 million years ago until today. This is fossil data looking at the extinction rate. So you're simply looking at the fossils, all the fossils you have, and saying, oh, look, I've got a new one coming in, I've got a new one coming in, oh, I've lost that, extinction. I've lost that one, extinction. Okay, you're just tabulating that. And what you see is there's a background rate of extinction, but what you also see are these massive peaks in extinction. Okay? Um, and it depends what you consider to be a mass extinction event. Most people will talk about five or six in the history of life. And these are huge. This is the one you're familiar with, the one that killed the dinosaurs. And notice, it's much, much this is the real biggie. This happened between the Permian and Triassic. This is the end Permian here. And it resulted in the extinction of 95% of all species. 19 out of 20 species eliminated, bang, in a very, very short period of time. And just to give you a sense of that, this is what a pre-Permian extinction environment looked like. Happy fish, looks sort of nice. Not, it looks a bit like Bodrum or something. Um, and then bang, pff, virtually nothing. Okay? So, by the way, this is important in the geological column, the geological table. Um, so you should be familiar with these periods starting from the pre-Cambrian, which uh, the Cambrian starts at 542 million years ago, and you have these periods, which you've heard of. But interestingly, we tend to get mass extinction events at the boundaries between periods. Why is that? Well, think about it. So you have between the Permian and Triassic, that's the big one, but also between, this is the dinosaur killing one, between the Cretaceous and the Tertiary. Well, what you need for a geological period is I want to be able to identify that this rock here in Canada is in the same place in terms of time as this rock here in Australia. And as I think I've already mentioned, if you've got Dinosaur, 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 no dinosaur, no dinosaur, di no dinosaur in Canada. And I've got the same thing in Australia, dinosaur, 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 no dinosaur, no dinosaur. Okay? That transition is a good landmark in the rock record. And that's why geologists have designated these boundaries as where they are. And now we know they're associated with mass extinction events. Uh, very quickly, we don't want to miss out on mass extinction. Just to emphasize mass extinction is not simple. It's not like, oh, a rock came along, hit everyone on the head, and that was it. Okay? This is a model, and uh, the details aren't important. It's a model for the end Permian extinction. I just want to make the point, it's a network of events. That's the first one I want to make point. I want to, it's not a simple one cause event. Also, and this is somebody's list of seven Mass ex sorry, um, six mass extinction events. Um, they all have different causes. It's not like there's one thing that's happening every time you get a mass extinction event. This is the dinosaur killing. And by the way, you call it, if you want to sound technical, don't call it a rock. You say bolide. And try and say it like that, bolide. Okay? Um, so, complex causation and different causation for each one. Let's talk about the one we're interested in, the one that killed the dinosaurs. It was discovered in 1981 um, by this team who were doing an interesting thing. They were measuring the amount of an element called iridium in certain rocks. Now, iridium is not naturally present in the Earth's crust. So where does iridium come from? It comes from space. 
there's a slow rain of iridium atoms from space coming down to Earth all the time. Very slow. Okay? What they found in a particular region was you had the slow buildup of iridium atoms. Atom, atom, atom. Suddenly, poof, tons of iridium. Super rich. What's happened? Well, they, and this is known as the iridium anomaly. What happened, they figured, was they had a, we had a bolide impact. There it is, caught on film, about 65 million years ago. And the cool thing, that was a prediction. They figured that was the only way you could explain all that iridium. So they predicted there should be a crater associated with that event where this bolide hit the planet. And we found it. It's, just, it's in the Caribbean basin just off um, uh, the Yucatan Peninsula. So what happened? A rock, a bolide the size of Manhattan. This is straight out of Wikipedia, so I have no idea whether it's true, but it sounds good. Uh, it's uh, two million times greater than the biggest nuclear bomb ever tested. Uh, the critical thing is it's, it kicks up all this particulate matter in the atmosphere, gets distributed in the jet stream, and you've suddenly got um, global darkness. Okay, So no photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the key input into ecosystems. Now, is that a problem for plants? Yes, it's not a long-term problem for plants because they have seeds. The seeds can survive for years and years and years. And when the sun comes back, they're okay. Is it a problem for herbivores? Is it a problem for carnivores? Absolutely. Especially dinosaurs. So, uh, just, so this is to try and teach you something useful. Um, this is what it looks like. You need a motorcycle. There it goes. There it goes. It's not looking good. Bad traffic. It's like Istanbul. <laughs> Don't do this. Okay. <laughs> Don't stand on the beach. Uh oh. Now I really like this simulation. Look at this. Look at the shock wave. Now, think of the tidal wave. Get out of the, out the oil industry. No! Oof. And then, of course, you have to take out New York City because it's a disaster movie. Um, so, it's tough on New York. Poor old Statue of Liberty. Off she goes. Anyway, you can see why it upset the dinosaurs. What are they doing? Um, so very quickly, uh, here's the impact point. The cool thing is we now have lots of information of a huge tidal wave, which occurred at the same time throughout this part of the Gulf of Mexico. So this almost certainly was the event uh, that was key. Also, by the way, there was lots of massive volcanic activity in India. Uh, the Pakistanis amongst you won't be surprised the Indians were partly to blame. Um, uh, so that's also kicking dust up into the atmosphere. And probably it was the pairing of these two events that was critical. And we don't really understand why it killed the dinosaurs but didn't kill us. But it was absolutely critical because we evolved about, at about the same time as we being mammals, evolved around the same time as dinosaurs, about 220, 210 million years ago. So until 65 million years ago, we mammals were rats, this big. They never got bigger because they were dinosaurs, right? This is, remember, ecological competition. The, the little guys stayed little because the big guys had taken all advantage of all those opportunities, right? So it's only the elimination of the dinosaurs that allowed, it, allowed mammals to, if you like, take off. And we, human beings, are the product of that 
takeoff, that great mammalian takeoff that occurred after 65 million years ago, after the mass extinction event, the bolide mediated mass extinction event uh, that took out the dinosaurs. So we've got to mammals after the break. Please be back by, you've got six minute, minutes, 11.41, we will talk about human evolution.